Hi everyone, my name is Courtney and welcome or welcome back to my channel and today is going to be another book review. So today we are going to be discussing Iron Widow by Zhang Zhe Zhao. If you don't know, this is a young adult sci-fi fantasy novel and it came out in 2021 to big hype and buzz, both here on booktube as well as on booktok. And part of the hype and buzz is because this author, Zhang Zhe Zhao, has recently been making YouTube videos and their first video actually just became a trending video. Video. It was just going to be a one-off video for them, but they decided to continue making YouTube videos because of the success of that one. That video popped up on my For You page and I was interested in it, so I also watched it, but it's basically discussing the new live action Mulan. And I think in that video, they either compared to the old one or they made a separate video after that talking about the old one. But basically they discuss not only the themes and like how the movie works, like a regular movie critique and like why it didn't work as a movie, but they also discuss the historical accuracy Accuracy, the cultural accuracy of the movie. And from there, they covered Mulan, Avatar The Last Airbender, a bunch of different shows that have Chinese mythology or cultural aspects or historical aspects in them. And they are just a fascinating YouTuber. I love their stuff. And I think that popularity of making that lucky once in a lifetime video did help their reader base grow. And so this popped off when it was finally published. So this is a 2021 release. And like I've said, this has gotten a lot of hype and buzz. So once I finally read the novel and decided I was going to make a review on it, I was thinking a lot about what I could add to this conversation because obviously there are a lot of reviews talking about it. What could I add to the conversation? Not that you need to add to the conversation as a reviewer, but I tend to chicken out on making review videos out of laziness, out of there's enough reviews of this book that I don't need to put it out there because it's not going to get a lot of views, whatever. But it's like when I was thinking about it, I'm like, hey, I've read a lot of YA. I understand the genre, even if I don't like it at times. And I also understand how the genre is changing, how it's growing. Also, the other thing, the hype has gone down since it's been out for a year. So maybe that is also adding something different to the conversation now as a reviewer. And I also think I have something to add because I didn't hate the book and I didn't love it either. So I hope to give a compelling unbiased critique or as unbiased as it can be. And the other thing I can add is that I am a reader, but I'm also a writer. So I hope I can give a nuanced perspective from both writing craft side as well as a reading side. So Iron Widow. This is a YA sci-fi fantasy, like I said, and this book is set in a world inspired by ancient Chinese myth and history. And it's mainly focused on this one historical figure who was the first Chinese empress and only Chinese empress, I believe. So it's inspired from mythology, it's inspired from history, but it is not a complete retelling. Also, it is set in a hybrid fantasy sci-fi world. There is like something that could be considered like magic. The world itself is a little bit regressed, especially in the poor area. There's also like all this technology and mech suits. So it's kind of a hybrid between a sci-fi world and a fantasy setting. So for a summary, in this world, there are these large mech suits that different couples will power and fight in. Basically you have a male pilot and then you have his female co-pilot who's considered lower in the hierarchy. And these female pilots normally end up like self-sacrificing or dying in the act of these combat battles where these mech suits are used. There are different levels of mech suits. There's different fighters and pilots that are higher in this hierarchy. But basically these women are auctioned off by their family for money or they themselves offer themselves up to be these co-pilots. Most of the pilots die before the age of 25, but a lot of times the female pilots will die after a first run in the mech suit. They are seen as like these big celebrities. They are given like the status, noble kind of distinguished, especially the ones that end up being really powerful. And the way that you're powerful is just you are born with a certain amount of chi and some people are born with more than others. Well, we'll get into it, but there's different types of chi, there's different types of power, blah, blah, blah. But focusing in our main character, the story starts and follows Zitian, who is hellbent on revenge for her sister. Her sister was offered up as a consort or concubine, her family to get money. Her sister died outside of battle, which is basically like dishonorable and it's not good. And it basically kind of hints at the fact that she died not from being in a fight, but from outside causes. It's either hint at or Zitian suspects that, that the pilot killed her sister and she is planning to offer so herself up to the same pilot in the hopes of getting close to him so that she can kill him and enact revenge. She only has thoughts of revenge. She has no thoughts of her life. Basically, she is treated 
horribly by her family in this really misogynistic society. She has been forced to bind her feet, which gives her severe pain. The women in her life are not helping her because they are also tied into this system of oppression. And she basically, you know, just hates her life. The only thing she has to look forward to is like, be, being forced to be a pilot, being forced to be married. She doesn't want any of those things. And with her sister gone, there's nothing to live for. So she's going to kill for her sister and then hopes to be killed herself. So before we get into a scene by scene summary, close to a scene by scene summary, I did miss some sections, I'll be honest. I just want to discuss the trigger and content warnings for this book. So obviously with her hellbent on this revenge story and with her not really caring about her own self, there are suicidal ideations, discussions of suicide with this misogynist society. Obviously there is misogyny as well as violence and abuse and discussions of sexual assault as well as off-page sexual assault. And then the other big content trigger warning that I caught was alcohol abuse or substance abuse where the alcohol addiction is a forced addiction. One of the characters is forced into having that addiction. So my thoughts before we get into spoilers, I gave this book a 3.75. It's not quite a four star but it's not quite a three star either. I enjoyed it a lot. There were a lot of things that I really enjoyed. I want to continue with the series, but there are a lot of things that didn't work for me as well. So those are my thoughts. So let's get into the spoilers. So kind of, again, going scene by scene, skipping some of the less important scenes, I guess. So the big first couple scenes that happens is Zitian escaping her hellish life in the countryside and becoming a consort. She leaves her friend behind, Iju, who at the last minute tries to promise himself to like marry her and like take her away. But again, she is hellbent on revenge. So she pushes him aside and goes after what she wants. After that, she's taken in as a concubine. We learn that she's really powerful, that she has a lot of like that spirit chi. And in her first battle, she is pretty easily able to kill the pilot by taking over his concubine. Consciousness. And that's it. The revenge is complete. She's killed him. She's proven herself really powerful. All she has to wait for is death, which will surely come because she's been proven to be too powerful and a murderer. But that doesn't happen because she is now seen as valuable because she is so powerful. So because of that, she is allowed to be kept alive and she is now going to be paired with Li Ximin, who is the strongest pilot and is the pilot who always ends up killing his girls or consorts in every single battle no questions asked. So it's a good way to give Ximin another pilot as well as killing her off in the process. And if it wasn't bad enough to be paired with the strongest pilot where you know you're going to be killed, Ximin is also a, a murderer of his entire family and he's basically treated as a war criminal. So she's not even getting the status of being like this high profile celebrity because both of them are treated like criminals. So once we enter the jail with Ximin, we learn more about like how he's been treated by the government. He's been treated as so dangerous to the point where he's not even given glasses, his glasses anymore. And he's been forced into a codependent relationship with alcohol to keep him fighting and to basically keep him malleable. Without the alcohol, he will not fight. Before the alcohol, he would not fight either. So they needed a way to get him dependent on something to get him to keep fighting and killing girls. In this captivity, they grow closer to each other. And also as a couple, they are getting the freedom and privileges to kind of go around the military base and to get some training to learning to fight together, which oddly involves figure skating. This is one of the first places I had problems with this novel. We are kind of thrown into a new location very quickly after just seeing a small hint of the society. And, and so we basically have to throw out all the rules that we learned from her being paired with her first pilot and have to learn all these new society rules and like what's allowed for her and Shumi. So with that, it's really hard because the rules are changed again where they're now allowed some freedom and it becomes just really hard to kind of follow what's allowed, what isn't allowed, the rules that are placed on them as a couple, as murderers, who are basically shunned by society, but also seen as like very powerful, very strong, and like the top fighting group. But the couple grow closer to each other. Zitian has a hard time fighting and figure skating and all of that stuff because she basically cannot let go of control or trust Shumin, but they slowly grow closer as we learn more of Shumin's backstory. And basically one of the saving things in their relationship is having this like fake press relationship. So if they're not celebrities, at least they're infamous and staying in the public eye is helping them from being outright killed. After some battles, Iju, who is again that friend from before, turns up and it turns out he's not just some like rich boy. He is like also related to a mob family and is 
the heir of this mob family. And he is able to pull strings and get them to the capital, which again, changing rules of what they're allowed to do, changing scenes again, changing locations again, which again, it's really hard to do. So at this point, you know, we've already fallen into the backstory of Shuming. We're seeing Zutian falling in love with him and her sort of trying to trust him and caring for him, which is already a difficult pill to swallow, not because it's not compelling or doesn't make sense or isn't good, but it's happening really, really quickly. And with that, again, we're swept away with new characters, a new situation, a new dynamic, new locations, just a lot going on. And on top of that, new societal rules, new societal structures, and just like rules of what they're allowed to do. At some point, Zutian and Shuming get married and make a deal with Iju's father. Basically, they're gonna keep themselves in the public eye. They're connecting themselves to the press, which will hopefully keep them from getting killed. Killed, and will keep them having some control and ability to pull the strings behind the scenes of what they're allowed to do. At this point, they're living in the capital now. They break Shuming of his addiction and they start this polyamorous love triangle between the three characters. If you know anything about a YA love triangle, it's so great to finally see the love triangle coming into its full complete form. Iju loves both Shuming and Zutian, and Zutian loves both boys, and both boys love her. It's just, it's finally coming together as a great triangle instead of, you know, this one-sided little angle. So from there, they have a really intense, hard battle. We meet some of the other characters that pilot these things, but that's not as important. What is important is that in this big mech battle, we learn that the mech suits might actually be biased and actually be intentionally making the girls die off to save the boys. And the women are kind of like batteries for the suits. I didn't see as a reveal. I thought that was kind of like an obvious setup of the system. It's hard because we know that the characters are not seeing what we're seeing and they've been living in this society full of lies for so long that it's hard for them to understand and accept these things but it's also hard for us as readers because that seemed like an obvious thing from the get-go the women were dying quickly it seemed like they were being used as batteries i'm pretty sure there are some comparisons to that or allusions to that in the beginning but anyway it's a reveal it's a big thing and the other big thing in this battle is that iju is outside of the mech suit he's able to give some of his chi to help power the two in the mech suit. The other big thing about the mech suit that I haven't talked about is that, like I said, Zhutian is really powerful. She is able to kind of overcome the the pilot. Shimming, they are both about the same equal, so they're kind of fighting together, although they have a hard time trusting each other, so they're fighting together ends up being fighting against each other, especially because Zhu Tian should be letting go and she can't do that. But sometimes she's able to overpower Shuming, sometimes she isn't, and sometimes they fight so much that they create like bad forms or monstrous forms of their uh, fighting. But eventually Zhu Tian is learning so that she can power the mech suit by herself. So in the final battle of the story, they are trying to get back lost territory. They are in an advantageous point where the alien force that they have been fighting this whole time has kind of pulled back so it's like a very opportune time to try and get this territory back but they are losing this battle because the government is actually sending warriors against Shiming and Zitian to try and kill them off. And Iju also happens to also be in the mech suit at this time, trying to help them out. Shiming knows they're losing and knows that they are going to lose this fight because they are trying to fight off not only the enemies, but also the enemies from the inside. So Shiming exits Zitian and Iju out into the wild. And from there, they see nomads, the territory, who are trying to point them in some direction. And from there, they find the yellow dragon who is ruled by the 200 year old emperor who has been kind of mythogized to being in a frozen state somewhere in the wilderness for somebody to wake up at some point. This whole myth ends up being true. He's there with the yellow dragon. And so Zitian wakes him up and is like, hey, I will cure your illness if you let me pilot your yellow dragon. The emperor is kind of like, what is going on? But allows her to join forces with him and allows her to be the main pilot. And from there, they defeat the alien attack and they go against the army, revealing the bias and flaw that the suits have against the female pilots. From there, she makes herself empress. Shuming has been taken by the government and is being held as like a pawn to try and get her to work with them. And then we learn that this planet that they've been fighting these aliens on is not Earth, but in fact, an alien planet that they have conquered. 
So they are not fighting an invading force of aliens like we thought the entire time, but instead are the invaders themselves. So, oh boy, that was a lot. And that's just covering a basic synopsis. There's more scenes in here, more stuff that happens. Obviously I skipped a lot of stuff, but I think that kind of tells you everything you need to know. It gives us a good start for my criticism or critique of this book. So this book is a little under 400 pages. It's not big type, but it's not super small either. So it's a pretty standard YA, maybe like 50 pages longer than a lot of YA fantasy books. But I would say like an average new debut YA fantasy, they tend to be around 300 to 350 pages. And this is just under 400 and a lot, a lot, a lot happens. There are a lot of scenes that I do believe are really good, but it goes by quickly and it's hard to follow. The characters are changing. They're changing their motives as we learn more about them. Zitian's desire to live and to trust is changing and her love of Shuming and Iju is blossoming. And we're going scene by scene really, really quickly. So it's hard to follow her changing character. It's hard to follow her falling in love with Shuming. Not that it's not believable. It's so quick that it's hard to digest. I just wish there were more drawn out scenes of her trusting and falling in love with these two characters. Because this is going by so quickly and because it's really happening from scene to scene to scene without any like in-between narration and digestion, what's happening is is that in scene we are getting the character giving us chunky explanations of her telling us that she is feeling these feelings towards these boys and that how she sees these boys is changing. Her understanding of these characters are changing. So we get a lot of her talking about her feelings and not a lot of moments of her getting actions of her feelings changing. It's a lot of her in scene, in narration, telling us these things without it really being shown to us. And it's not that it's not believable because these characters are really compelling. So it's really easy to fall in love with these characters and their relationships. But I wish it took more time to unravel these characters. I wish it took more time for Zetian to trust them and to like them, or at least more figurative space in the story. I wish it had been months and months and months going through scene by scene by scene and it really gave us those time gaps but it doesn't it happens really really quickly both in scene and in the story itself and it makes it hard to follow the other thing that i talked about it's hard to follow the society rules she goes from being jailed to being allowed back into basic society and again this society is different than the one she grew up in because it's in the city now and it's more like celebrity status we're learning about society with her and it's a lot there is a lot of rules and it's not clearly defined and there's just a lot going on that I'm trying to figure out about how the world works and how she sits in it. It talks a lot about the misogyny side of things, what women's roles and place in society are, but I just want to understand the society, how it works, how regressed is it, how technologically advanced it is, what it looks like. The hard part is, is that that's not the end of the world building. There's so much other world building out there. It's not just the rules and society structure. We also have a whole ass fantasy system to learn. And with these mech suits, there's a lot of information. So we start off with the five elements that can be powered through chi. That makes sense. I've heard of that in mythology before, but it's also like we have different mech suits and they're all different animal shapes. And the animals mean something about the power of the owners and they're all owned by different people and different couples and they all have different names and so they're different characters and there's just so much going on with that and again we're reading it if it was a movie it might be a little easier to follow but we're reading it so it's it's a lot of information that you're trying to remember and digest about all the characters different animals have different levels different animals have different chi they can use they also have different forms they can evolve into like a mech suit some forms are bad some forms are good the forms mean different things and means different levels of chi and it's a it's a lot to follow so it really quickly spirals into being very complicated and just very hard to remember we're remembering all these characters and their motivations all these new side characters and what their goals are we're trying to figure out what the society works in like everything with that. And we're also trying to figure out this really complicated magic system and remembering everything about it. So it's like the fight scenes, they are really good. They are really cinematic to read from, but I can't always remember who's who and you know what it means and what it looks like when they transform into different sizes. We have new people, we have new society structures, we have new locations. And to put a heavy complicated magic system on top of that, it's a lot. It's a lot to digest, especially when scenes are moving so quickly. There's no point where we just are given information and are able to digest things. There's always new information being added. And on top of that, there's all the messaging of feminism and the misogynistic society, as well as like a yin and yang 
theme. There's a lot of different themes. And so there's just a lot going on in a small amount of space. And that's where my biggest critique comes from. Most of the book is just really going from scene to scene to scene without any narration to kind of fill out things to kind of show the passage of time to help connect us to different moments to really pull us through the character arcs and there's no really moments to breathe and really digest and understand the world we're just kind of getting pulled around without really moments of clarity at least for me i read a lot of high fantasy i read a lot of fantasy that doesn't reveal all the rules all the at once that does an info dump but at some point it, if it's going to be really complicated and convoluted and just all over the place, it has to be told in a really compelling way where it feels really controlled with the information that we're getting and when we're getting it. Or it just has to simplify it and make it really understandable. Look at like Brandon Sanderson. He has a lot of rules, a lot of complicated things, but I'm never really truly lost. And if I am lost and I forget what the different Mistborn powers are in Mistborn, I can go to the back of the book and remember what the metal means. But otherwise, it's very scientific and I understand the rules of the society enough that I can and pull myself through the story without getting bogged down by the magic system. And then I think of stories like N.K. Jemisin's The Broken Earth Trilogy. Things are really complicated. You're only getting a small sliver of what the world looks like, and you're only getting a small sliver of how the society works and how the magic works. But it's a slow reveal of information to the point where it just makes it really compelling when you learn something new, and it makes it really easy to kind of cultivate the understanding of the world slowly through the entire series. There's so many parts of this novel that would have worked easier easily in a denser, bigger book. It would have been able to come together easily if it had been a 700-800 page book where it was slowly progressing through the different moments and scenes. So before my camera dies, let's get into what I like. I liked the cinematic writing. I liked the characters, especially Zetian, who was this angry woman who had a will of her own. She was a character that would kill you. We also have Iju. He is sneaky, conniving, kind of prince boy who reveals himself as a mob heir. So he has layers and depth to him as well. And he, again, is a character that will kill you for his benefit. And sandwiched in between them, we have Shuming, who is the murderer, the killer, but again, has layers to him where he's really just a soft boy who doesn't want to kill you. He can, but he doesn't want to. That triangle is really compelling. Those three characters really compelling. Zitian especially is just a very compelling female character. She has reasons for her anger and her outrage and her arc is just really fascinating. She's coming into the book ready to die basically. Her realization of not wanting to die Again, is a little sloppy in my opinion, but I do think it's compelling. It's a compelling storyline. And I love how we got over the revenge plot so quickly. It's the first thing that is handled. And so the entire book series is all about what now? I've, I'm suddenly not going to die. What do I do now? Instead of ruminating over the same motivations, dragging us through the revenge plot for three books, it's handled easy peasy. It's something a lot of YA books would sit in for the entire series as the main motivation for the entire book. But again, we cover it really quickly and we get to move on to new things to expanding the world, to expanding the characters. And I appreciated that choice so, so much. You have no idea. So this story, it has compelling characters. It has compelling story. It has compelling themes and it has compelling scenes. But for me, it happens so quickly and there's not the space, like the tendons between the muscle and the bone to really fill out the story and connect everything together for it to be fully satisfying. It was still really good and I really enjoyed it, but it wasn't perfect. <laughs> and it's hard to expect perfection. We as humans are not perfect. How can our works of art be perfect? That's too philosophical. It just, I needed more from this book. And I was kind of left with this thought that I wish that this had been a big, chunky adult fantasy novel so that this novel could be more explicit. So this novel could be better paced and could be really long. I don't often feel that way when I'm reading YA. I don't often feel like a YA book should be more adult because YA books are not meant for adults. They are meant for their teen readers. You know, there's a lot of big discussions about the YA genre and the readers of it. And so it's like, especially this book that represents so much, I don't want to take it from a young adult reader. I really don't. You know, not that it was too good for a YA genre or whatever, but it just, it felt like this novel wanted to be an adult novel. It felt like it wanted to be an 800, 900 page book. It felt like it needed the space to grow. It felt like it wanted to be more explicit in the gore and the mature content. Not that YA novels can't be any of those things. I know for a fact that this novel had its sex scene taken out. I'm pretty sure that has been confirmed. And honestly, when the author was first talking about this novel, I thought for sure they said it was a adult novel. I don't remember it being a 
YA novel originally. And to me, like, I don't want to speculate too much because I don't know what went into the editing and writing process, but to me, it really felt like this book was taken and streamlined into a YA novel when it really, it should have been a adult fantasy novel and that it should have been left to expand and be big and chunky and beefy. That's what the novel felt like to me, like it wanted to be. And again, it's hard. I don't want to take this book away from readers. I know it's an important book, not just in representation, but it's a good, compelling story that a lot of teens connect to and can relate to and can enjoy. But I also just, ugh, I wanted this novel to be so much more and it felt like it really could have been because again it's really really compelling. I think we're going to conclude the the ranting, the critiquing, the gushing and just ended the discussion with I enjoyed this novel. It was not perfect for me but I am looking forward to the second book in the series. I believe it's a trilogy. I will read all three books. I'm compelled enough but I'm left thinking that this isn't the best book I've read. This isn't the worst. It's definitely on the higher end of especially stuff I've read recently for YA, but I feel like this book has run into a lot of the same problems that a lot of other YA novels are running to, which is in that they are being really heavily streamlined and they're way too fast paced so that I at least cannot feel fully situated into the world and the magic system and everything because we're going way too quickly trying to cover too much stuff. So in the end, this is a great debut, a great first book in a series. I'm excited to see where it expands, especially as Jiren Zhe Zhao becomes a situated author. Just as they become a author who has written and published more, I think that they are going to blossom into a great writer. I really would love to see them in film writing as well. I think they would do a really good job. But yes, this is my review of Iron Widow. I hope I brought something new to the table, something that has gone unsaid or at least not dived deep into enough. Or at least I hope I can provide a helpful summary for people that are getting ready to read the second book. There's always that. But thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys later and happy reading.